Hi everybody, it's Heather Cox, your roving reporter. This is our second segment um, for Dolphin in our school spotlight, and I have Miss Felton here with me. She is also a Vanguard member. We have a lot of wonderful Vanguard members here at Dolphin. Um, and what I wanted to talk to you about today is one of the principles that we have for personalized learning, which is choosing how to demonstrate what you know. When you have your students and they're demonstrating, do you give them specific things that they must demonstrate or do they get a little bit of freedom with that? No, I give my students a lot of choice and they have freedom to choose whatever they want and we work on different ways to present and thinking about is this right for what you're trying to show, what you want your audience to see. So we do work on a lot of things like that. I like that you kind of guide them to making the right choice based upon what they want to show because I think sometimes kids get confused <laughs> about which which thing is going to work for their particular project. Now, there's not a lot of time in the school day, so no. do you spend all sorts of time teaching them how to use every one of these tools? No, I don't. I kind of let them explore and learn on their own and if there's a problem or a glitch, then I'll take a few minutes and we have some downtime or computer lab time and we'll go over like, okay, let's practice this feature. Do we need this? Because a lot of times they'll get hung up on, oh, this is cute, let me add this <laughs> over and over again. So I try to go over, it's not about the prettiness of it, but about do you have the content what I'm asking for? Like yeah. when you first teach them how to use Word or PowerPoint yes. and they <laughs> spend forever yes. on the font. Yes, oh, that's <laughs> yes. For PowerPoint. clearly the most important yes. part. Uh, now the thing they use when they're demonstrating their learning. Did do you know how to use all of them 100%? Are you an expert in all of them? No, things? I'm not. Actually, they teach me things sometimes. They'll find something and I say, "Oh, let's share this with our friends so they can learn how to do it because I don't know everything and I just let them play around with it." That's, that's wonderful. I mean, yes. it, being able to take that risk and not know everything, even as a Vanguard member, you're yes. saying you don't know everything, no. you don't have the answers to everything, but just letting the kids explore yes. um, and then share that out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We will talk to a few more teachers from Dolphin. Hi, everybody. I'm back with Megan Endicott from Dolphin Elementary School. We had a full roving reporter segment with Megan, but we are back just to get a little snippet about personalized learning and how that looks in the music classroom. Because most of the time, I'm sure that people imagine just a whole class, everybody sitting and listening to the music teacher. So tell us how exactly do you personalize learning? Um, you know, I feel like when they're learning the concept at the very beginning, it's key to really spend time getting to know what do they know mm -hmm. and um, finding ways to teach them in their own personal way how to get to that final accomplished goal so that you can do the group stuff and mm -hmm. make the big music programs and, and perform and all of those great wonderful things. Yeah. So um, an example of something that I like to do um, is a quick assessment at the beginning to see where we are in our learning. Um, sometimes it's as simple as a quick fingers, thumbs, whatever. Sometimes it's, it's uh, more easily assessed through a Kahoot or Nearpod, mm -hmm. things like that, of course. Um, and then I um, group them based on what they know and um, try to help them with the process. So right now, um, a big thing with my SOLFEG unit, I have um, students working in leveled instructive groups um, with me actually um, conducting the lesson through TouchCast, a video. Oh. So I'm giving the instruction based on what I know the students need to learn. So it's, I created the content. Um, within that, I embed live links based on remediation or enrichment as needed for that particular topic. So each group might have different places to go. And again, it's hard to find those music things, but mm -hmm. it's very easy to make those. With Go Anime and all those like iMovie, you can mm -hmm. make quick little videos with cartoon characters because they're really engaged, and then give them the instruction that they need based on where they are. So my bottom group is doing something with um, uh, written activity. They're building from the bottom up. Okay. They're learning their notes and writing a short, quick one measure using the pitch syllables that were learning. Oh. And then the next group is going, uh, they're creating an edge of creation okay. where they're taking the same concept. We're still learning Do, Re, Mi, and So, but they're actually putting it on a staff, drawing it, annotating, and talking and describing it to me, recording it, and submitting it to my account. So I have that, that um, set. Then my, own, my top group is doing um, Quaver Music, and then on there, they're actually creating music in a real, kind of real software. It's kind of like Finale. Okay. So they're actually building a song because they are able to do that using their same pitch syllables. So now they're able to add a bass line, chords, and harmonies, and things like that. And 
this is a perfect example of where instructional technology fits in really well yes. because while you can personalize learning without it, there are some situations where it <laughs> makes the process much easier, this clearly being one of them. But what's amazing about it is then you're going to be able to see what each and every student knows right. and not just a bunch of kids and maybe the, the best singer or the loudest you know voice right. in the classroom is giving you those answers. So you really will be able to then do the instruction based upon where your students right. genuinely are. And they're all able to submit in each of these different ways so that I can take time and spend time reviewing and learning what they know and what they don't know where we still need to, to go from there. Um, you know, another an idea that we could do as far as personalized learning without technology, mm -hmm. um, the teacher can lead a group of the um, students that need a little more help. That's okay. kind of how I put it. Yes, I can do this with your help. Um, and then the group that thinks, yes, I got it, I can teach you that you can make um, soulfish flashcards where they're kind of doing around the world like they do in math class, mm -hmm. but in music class you can do something similar. The kid that gets the first five cards becomes the new teacher, so you can make things work in your classroom in all sorts of ways without having those pieces, but the technology helps with 700 students yes. track and keep, you know, keep it all in one kind of nice spot so that you can easily, you know. Well, it'll certainly be nice then when Dolphin gets those devices. They are a <laughs> really? group one school, so <laughs> sooner rather than later, we may have to check back once they are all in here. Um, but thank you so much for joining us again with Megan Endicott. If you're looking for more information about the music classroom, make sure you visit our original video. Um, for a full tour of her music classroom. I'm here with Lauren Busing, a fourth grade teacher at Dolphin Elementary School, another one of our Van Dirk members here. Yay. Lauren is going to talk to us a little bit about how she groups her students and how that leads her then to some just-in-time direct instruction. So Lauren, just give us an idea of how you get to that point. Sure, so um, both of my math blocks are mixed level. So at the beginning of each math block, block I teach a mini lesson to each group of students. After that mini lesson, the students know that they get on soccer div, answer just a couple questions, assessing the skill that I just taught, soccer div or another digital tool. Mm -hmm. Based on that data, I pull my small groups. So if they do really poorly, they know that they're pretty much in small groups with me. Mm -hmm. If they just need a little bit more practice with the skill, I have an independent assignment that they work on. And if they've shown me mastery of the skill, then they know they're working on their project-based learning task that involves the skills being taught in class. I love that. And, and, and for those of you that are not familiar with Socrative or any of those other tools, what's so nice about them is that you get the data immediately, immediately. and you can make those decisions right away. So it's not something that you tested you know, right. a week ago and then you're getting to later on. So typically I'm standing up in my active board kind of teaching in my small group and I have my iPad right next to me. It's pulled up to whatever Socrative they're working on and right away I can see if they get the question right or wrong and what areas I need to help them in. So even within that direct instruction, For sure. you can adjust it based on individual student needs. So maybe this student over here, they need help with one question while the others don't need help with that. Correct, and then I kind of let it go from there. If they get the skill down, then they know they can move on to the next task. Something else I've also done in the past is, you know, maybe once or twice throughout a unit, at night, kind of send a Google form home to my students, asking them if they need any other help with some skills being taught. Because sometimes they might, you know, show mastery with those mm -hmm. tools that I've just discussed, but they're really still uneasy or they need a little bit more confidence. So I send just a quick Google form home, they answer, maybe I need help adding and subtracting fractions or converting mixed numbers to improper fractions. So I can kind of check that out in the morning when I get to school, and if they said they need help with a skill, I know that they want help with that. And they don't have to, you know, go up in front of the class, ask me, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, that, that really incorporates even the choice in voice piece, right? and then also a, a bit of the students co-planning learning, sure. because they're making those decisions for themselves mm -hmm. and letting you know. And I love that you're able to use that Google form to allow them to do it privately. Right. That, like you said, you know, they don't always want everybody else to know, but right. it's a way for them to communicate that with you on their own. And it kind of helps, you know, them realize what they need to study because I think we really have to teach kind of study skills along the way. That's Absolutely. really at the elementary level. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for talking to us about those different principles. If you have any other questions, I'm sure Lauren would be happy to answer those. Thank, thank you. I'm here at the Arbery Dolphin Elementary School. I have Hope Knight with us. This is our very first Roving Reporter visit to an art room. So um, I want you to talk a little bit about the tool that they're using. We've all had iPads out and they're taking pictures. Talk to us about what that is. Okay, great. Well, we have been using the program called Artsonia for, this is our second year now. Okay. 
last year was our first year where we were kind of working out the kinks and seeing you know how how difficult or how easy it might be and it turned out that it was a really successful thing for us so this year we are using our ipads to uh, create digital portfolios Ooh, I love that. and it's great because the students can take photos of their art as they're working and then once the art is complete, they can choose the one that shows off their most complete, best idea. Not only can they edit and take photos, uh, they get to crop them, they get to change the light and dark features, so they get to do some good photo editing. Mm -hmm. They also get to write a title and an artist statement. And we talk a little bit about what the difference is in a title and an artist statement. A title is just a few words, mm -hmm. like the title of a song or a book. Okay. And an artist statement is a little bit more deep thought, where they're writing a few sentences about um, their own personal thoughts that they put into their work, or some of the different materials they use, or what their artwork is about. So beyond just art, they're really thinking about things. That's, exactly. And I love that they're creating that title and really putting almost that complete feel like a real artist exactly. somewhere else. Exactly, professional artists use art statements all the time. And one really exciting feature is that once it's published, people in their families are leaving comments on the art. So they're getting feedback on it, which is absolutely wonderful. Grandparents, aunts and uncles, parents, brothers and sisters, as long as they have the Artsonia code, which is shared by the parents, okay. then uh, all these people come on and they uh, share positive comments about how impressed they are with their artwork. Which is so great because I'm sure families are all over the world and they can still experience that artwork exactly. with the kids. And, and as a parent and, and of young ones, I get artwork constantly coming home. It would be nice to have that in a digital format where I could see all right. of those different things. And uh, one other really fun thing, when we opened up our Artsonia account this year after last year, and I wasn't really expecting this, they were able to see when they logged in, they were able to see all of their art from last year as well as this year, and it will continue to grow every year. So if they start out in kindergarten, by the time they are through fifth grade, they will have a really full digital portfolio. Oh, that's super exciting to see just how they've grown. Exactly. Um, I know I would have liked that because now I still think that my artwork looks like I'm in second grade. Right. So it would have been nice to see so that I have possibly grown with my art. Right, right. Um, thank you so much for letting us come in and take some videos. I'm sure if you, anyone has any questions about Art Sonia or how instructional technology can be infused in the art classroom, which I'm sure many don't expect that, um, I would I'd be willing to bet that Hope Knight here will we'll answer those questions That's for right. you. That's right. My email is Knight H at FultonSchools.org. So I'd be happy to help you with any uh, questions you might have trying it out. All right. Thank you so much.